All right, I will start presenting. Okay, Dylan? Sounds good. Thanks so much. So welcome everyone to Fast 4 2021. This is Wednesday morning in the Aconcagua Zoom. Uh, we will be starting with Dylan Halper, and he will be presenting OSGO in the browser, advancing client side web assembly device, geospatial analysis, and front end visualization using GSGODA and BIS.GL. So it's like yours. All right. Thanks so much, Jose. Really appreciate it. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming. Uh, and let me go ahead and share my screen. OK. Uh, so today, I'll be talking about uh, open source geo uh, in the browser, uh, taking some lessons and tools from the US COVID Atlas project. Uh, my name is Dylan Halpern. I work as a senior software engineer at the Center for Spatial Data Science in the Healthy Regions and Policy Lab uh, at the University of Chicago. Uh, so this is me. Uh, I come from a background in uh, city planning and design, uh, and before that, graphic design and visual communication. My work recently has really been with the Center for Spatial Data Science, working particularly on the US COVID Atlas. Uh, so what have I been working on recently? I've really focused on in-browser analytics with a focus on geospatial. Uh, here's a, a little GIF of the COVID Atlas project. So I've been working on data explorers related to COVID and understanding different dimensions. Uh, and then taking those learnings from that project, expanding them to things regarding environmental factors of opioids in the US uh, opioid epidemic, uh, urban environment for various factors and so on. Uh, along the way, I've also been working on making web mapping tools a bit friendlier, uh, trying to help clarify and make those a little bit easier to get started with DIY low code tools. So today, what are we talking about? I'm gonna be walking through some in-browser analytics uh, for uh, free and open source software Geospatial analytics, uh, particularly the toolkit today is JS Geoda, which is a library by Luke Enslin and Shwin Lee, which really powers a lot of the geospatial computation here, and VizGL, which that handles uh, all of the kind of mapping that, that underlies what's going on. I'm going to talk a bit about uh, why and why not you might want to use in browser analytics, uh, and then intro to the Web Geoda scaffolding, which is sort of the project that's come out of the COVID Atlas and is a template repository to get started with this sort of stack. So let's get started by asking, why would you want to use in-browser analytics? The server cost can be very low, and you also get a really high degree of user control in terms of what's going on and what they're able to see, the analysis they're able to do. With in-browser analytics, you get truly replicable code repos, especially if serving static data. Someone can clone down the repository as is, uh, and then go ahead and start interacting with it pretty directly. You also get a high degree of flexibility on the web infrastructure and where you host it. And potentially you have very performant interactions for analysis if you have a lot of different controls and variables that you're playing with. Lastly, you can also have offline capacities if you're dealing with sensitive data and you're working with a, a platform where people load in their data to the project. This may be something where if you have analytics in the browser, the data isn't going anywhere and you, you have an opportunity here to, to handle sensitive data or handle data, data privately. To put a point on longevity, uh, here in kind of the academic world, the uh, case study here is always the Google Fusion tables. Uh, that there were a ton of really interesting maps and communication uh, that went away when this tool sunset. Uh, and so these low code and no code tools can sometimes be a little bit ephemeral. And also projecting, you know, five, 10 years into the future, you don't always know exactly what the pricing structure or future set is going to be for every different platform that you're using. Let's talk about why not to use in-browser analytics, though, because there are sometimes reasons that it's not the best fit. Um, so client-side languages, meaning JavaScript, don't always have the same data processing and support uh, or ease of use very simply as some other languages. And uh, performance can be limited or it can be inconsistent. So you don't know exactly what the client environments are going to be for all of your users necessarily. So you have to make some best guesses about what that environment is going to be and then what sort of computation you can expect to do. Uh, especially for single threaded. And we'll, we'll talk about some options for multi-threading in a sec. Additionally, transfer size for packages and data can get very big as opposed to server-side processing. Uh, and so this can mean slow load times uh, depending on how you implement it. So let's start by talking about limitations of, of JavaScript and in you know, client-side languages with WebAssembly, which is a really, I'm calling it here, the great borrower. So WebAssembly, this is a compilation target for a variety of languages that usually run natively. 
Um, and they get a very similar performance, but they're able to compile to a specific binary that can then run in the browser. This has been a standard uh, in the World uh, Web Consortium since 2019 uh, and is supported by essentially all modern browsers. And pretty soon there will be p-thread support, which means options to try to implement some multi-threading directly through WebAssembly. Right now it's only supported by Chrome Canary. One thing that's been enabled by this is the JS Geoda library. So this is spatial data analysis in the browser. This is by Schwinn Lee and Luke Anselin, and this is a C++ library originally compiled into Wasm. So some of the key features here, you have a variety of binning techniques, such as Jenks, Hinge, Quartile, et cetera. And you can also use rate mapping, generate spatial weights, and do cluster and spatial autocorrelation. So this really advances the sorts of analyses and spatial data analysis that you can do right in the browser. Here's a quick code snippet of what using JS Geoda might look like uh, in JavaScript. So uh, we're using an ES6 syntax for the import, so import JS Geoda. Uh, and then we have an asynchronous function, get local Moren. Uh, the first line goes ahead and uh, calls JS new, which is a helper function uh, that uh, Dr. Lee built in. Uh, and this goes ahead and returns kind of the Geoda proxy that you'll do all of your analysis with. Next, we'll fetch our GeoJSON file and turn that into a, uh, an array buffer which Geoda can then read, generate weights off of, get some data from, and then ultimately produce the local Moran spatial autocorrelation st statistic. Um, this is all pretty cool, and it, it's, it's really fast, um, and it, it's reasonably easy to use. But what happens if you get some pretty big data, or you have more frequent calculations, or, or what if the client is really slow, or what if you're having interactions going on? It is an async function, so it's not going to overwrite uh, you know, synchronous functions uh, in terms of the JavaScript frames. But there are some other ways that we can speed this up. And so that's where web workers come in. So web workers, uh, this is a technique where you can pull out a script and have it run on a separate CPU thread uh, right in the browser. So this can be either short-lived or long-lived, um, and you can also set them up to work across browser tabs. Um, typically, they use uh, asynchronous messages to go back and forth, almost like an API. Uh, and I've been using uh, Google's comlink library a lot, which makes it uh, very easy and painless to use. So let's look at an example of that. So this is what the main script would look like using comlink. So you'd import comlink here. Uh, I'm declaring Geoda outside the function to use in a couple different places, but there are a lot of different ways to use, use this. Uh, you redefine comlink uh, uh, or redefine Geoda uh, by using comlink.wrap to have a new uh, worker script. And we'll see this in just a sec. This is where all the JS Geoda stuff is happening and then do the same geoda.new to go ahead and call that function uh, and instantiate the WebAssembly module. The rest of it here is exactly the same uh, for getting a local Moran statistic, uh, with the only difference being that everything is now asynchronous. So every function now needs async await to do that step than the next one. Uh, some of these could be combined with a promise all uh, working uh, between the main thread and the worker thread. But in this case, I've separated them out uh, for individual weights for simplicity. Uh, on the worker side, this is what we're looking at. So we import uh, comlink and JS Geoda. And we have a class here for the Geoda worker proxy. This has just one uh, property in its, in its constructor, uh, this.geoda. So this is where the sort of proxy for that WebAssembly is going to live. We have an async function new, which basically calls the JS Geoda function new, and then maps all of those functions onto the worker proxy itself. Uh, the last two lines here just declare a Geoda worker as a new Geoda worker proxy and calls, uses the keyword new, uh, and then exposes that to the main thread using comlink, and it's ready to go. Uh, so this is the sort of thing that this enables. Uh, so here we have, uh, uh, this is COVID data for uh, uh, cases normalized to population in the US. Uh, and so we can see there's this time series data, uh, and it's calculating for each day a local Moran's I spatial autocorrelation. Red means sort of the high, high counties or the hot spots. Blue is the cold. And as that animation is going, uh, as that calculation is going, uh, the 3D map is animated. We're able to zoom around, uh, interact with it. Even if this calculation only takes 100 milliseconds, if that's you know 100 milliseconds uh, hanging up the interface where it can't be doing and handling user interaction, it really limits the amount that you can do in terms of the user experience. Uh, so we're getting on time here, so I'm going to pick up the pace a little bit. Some other concerns why you might not want to use uh, analytics in the browser is in terms of data transfer size. JSON in particular and GeoJSONs can become very slow as you have a lot of data, a lot of columns, um, and TopoJSON uh, is not going to solve this particular problem. Um, so we've been using CSVs, just dynamically joining in the browser. 
uh, so providing a particular column that it can then join to with the data a bit more compressed. There are times when the CSVs are even too big, uh, or they can be optimized more, uh, and they are non-typed. So we've been using protobuffers as well with some custom schemas, which I'll show in a sec. Um, and additionally, related to protobuffers, uh, there's a geobuff standard, uh, which can be used as a shapefile successor. So here's an example of the schema we use as sort of a CSV replacement. Uh, so in protobuffer, everything is a message. So there are kind of two message types here, the first being a row, and this would be like one row of data. So you'd have a GUID followed by a set of packed integer 32 values, uh, and then a, a column, which basically this would give you all of your column names as a repeated set of strings, uh, and then a repeated set of rows. So this will give you one set of column names, and then a set of rows with an identifier, and then the data values. Uh, this is limited to integer 32. We sort of use a reverse scientific notation in our implementation. Uh, but you could also do this with uh, different data types if you so desired. Um, so what the outcome from this is, and this is before compression, so it's a little unfair here, but an 11.3 megabyte uh, CSV goes down to a 5.6 megabyte uh, protobuffer file or PBF. Um, the other challenge here is for the transfer size for the package for libraries. So incremental loading really helps a lot of this, uh, and the web workers themselves are, are kind of uh, by nature uh, split code and incremental loading. Uh, also, implementing caching very aggressively can help with this. Uh, and the, boss, the binaries for WASM, uh, particularly for C++ and Rust, I found are not too, too big, although they are big, but smaller than some of the other uh, WASM implementations. Uh, so if you're interested in learning more about this project, uh, it's online at uscovidatlas.org. Um, and if you're interested particularly in some of the infrastructure that's been going on here and the sort of uh, front-end or back-end data in the front-end, uh, you can go to uscovidatlas.org slash insights and look for the research tab. Uh, and that we have a paper there uh, from uh, doctors uh, Marina Kolak, Chingyun Lin, and Chuen Li that walks through uh, a lot in a lot more detail kind of what's going on here. So a couple limitations. On modern browsers and modern computers, uh, I found that the map graphics become a problem before anything else. So even when using DECGL and its WebGL renderer, which is super powerful, uh, the WASM calculations, the data management become a problem long after uh, what you're actually rendering onto the map. In terms of the transfer times and loading times, this connects with that third bullet there, that it's ultimately this like number of observations or number of features that limits what you can do. Um, I've been able to, with reasonable success across a reasonable recent range of computers, get into the maybe 15 to 20,000 observations uh, with slightly simplified geometries. Uh, and, and get away with that, um, but that's sort of pushing it. Definitely under 10,000 is pretty comfortable um, in terms of the unit of analysis. Um, and you can too. So uh, for this last little bit here, I think I have about 10 minutes left, eight minutes left. Uh, I'm gonna walk through some of the WebGeoda uh, framework stuff that we've been packaging out to make it a lot easier to get started with uh, this on your own. Uh, so I have a very quick demo here. Uh, so this is showing uh, just kind of what a WebGeoda pro end product might look like. Um, so you have a handful of different variables. These are being calculated on the fly. Uh, this brings in some of the desktop features of Geoda, uh, such as brushing and linking. Um, so the idea here is that what you do and interact with on the map is then reflected uh, in these sidebar widgets themselves. So in this case, we're selecting uh, different geographies uh, based on an area, uh, and then it shows up in the scatter plot and the histogram. And then conversely, we can also select based on a certain data range in that information visualization uh, and that filters on the map itself. And again, crucially, this is all being done in the browser. There's no, there's no backend server that's needed to run this. Um, additionally, we're able to do the autocorrelation statistic right in the browser. So here looking at household income, this is in this case in Colorado, uh, we can look at that. Uh, additionally, we have the option to switch between different geographies. So we can see we were on census block groups and switched over to counties. So the stack here is based on Next.js with DECGL for the geospatial viz, Vega for the information visualization, JSGeoda powering all the geospatial engine, and Redux for state management. Uh, this is all, of course, a React app, um, but we've been creating this with an interest of transferability in mind. So this could be taken into different JavaScript frameworks and not so locked in to the React ecosystem. Uh, so I'm going to walk through four key concepts here. Uh, and then a little bit of how to get started and how to uh, deploy your own uh, geospatial dashboard for free with WebGeoda. Uh, so the four kind of key concepts here are geospatial data, which this is going to be the geographies, the polygons that you're working with, uh, tables, which is going to be the tabular data uh, that gets joined to that geospatial in the browser, uh, variables, which is either 
can be either static or time series, normalized or raw. We'll go into this a little bit, but these are essentially how you want the data to be presented. And then finally, the widgets, these are those info viz, uh, right now looking at variable distributions and central tendencies. So the GeoData, pretty simple. Right now, it supports either uh, GeoJSON or uh, can be a Mapbox tile set. Uh, so you give it a name, in this case, Colorado Block Groups. You can see how it shows up under the geography select. I uh, give it the name of a file, and then you give it uh, an identifier column uh, that it's going to join to for the other data. Uh, ideally, you keep this minimal and load in all your data through the tables. Uh, here, right now, they're just supported CSVs, but we're also looking at supporting protobuffer files in the future. Uh, so you, again, give it a column uh, that's going to join to, and then when you load in your app, it's going to join that GeoJSON to the CSV but transfer them as is, uh, meaning that it's a very fast transfer and this is all done in parallel. The variables themselves look something like this. Oh, and one last note on the tables. You'll see here under tables, we have, we've called it ACS data. Uh, what you call that table can work across different spatial scales. Um, so what that means is you can have the same variables and the same tables uh, with the same kind of columns and switch seamlessly between different geographies. Um, and it sort of figures out which variables will go properly with which geographies. So here's what a variable would look like. Uh, so here we're calling it population density, and that's how it shows up here in the variable select. Uh, you choose a numerator and denominator table, in this case, both ACS data, and then a property for both, which is essentially the column name. So in this case, we have population divided by land area. We can also define a binning strategy, in this case, percentile breaks, as well as a color scale. And there are a handful of other flags you can do here, like the spatial autocorrelation. All of this configuration is done in a single JavaScript config file. Um, and then once you load in your data, which we'll look at in just a sec, it basically plugs everything together, figures it out, and then presents the data like we saw in the demo. So the widgets here, this follows a very similar uh, grammar where you'll tell it where you want it to display. There are three areas. There's a left column, a right column, and then sort of a hidden area. You'll tell it the type of uh, widget that you'd like, uh, the X and Y variables, or just the variable uh, for a, a histogram. Um, and then there are additional options there in our docs, things like regression and so on. Right now, we support a histogram, scatter plot, a scaled 2D circle histogram, sort of a, a scaled dot based on the zone, and a heat map, and lots more on the way. As far as data loading goes, you just plug in your static data into the CSV and GeoJSON folders uh, within the public folder in the repo, and you're good to go. Uh, getting started, uh, this is a template repo. So you can just go to web or geoda center slash web geoda, click use this template. Uh, and you'll start a repo right from there. You can also fork it directly, uh, or you can also use something like dget to go ahead and copy uh, the files and, and scaffold it into a new project. Uh, so you'll need just Node.js for this, uh, which you can go ahead and install from their website. Uh, and then once you have that in the repo, you can do npm install. That's going to install all of your Node modules. Uh, and then you uh, can run npm run dev, which is going to run the development server. And you can start playing around, uh, adding data, changing variables, and so on. Uh, in terms of deployment, uh, I'm going to show Netlify here. Uh, we also provide instructions for things like Vercel, GitHub Pages, uh, and ways to export this statically. Uh, but you can go ahead and just click a new site from Git, um, and that'll take you through this GUI to go ahead and connect your uh, GitHub account or GitLab or Bitbucket. Um, and you can go through. You choose the repository, choose the branch you want to work with. Um, you'll need to add a, a API key for Mapbox for, if you want the base tiles. Um, and in this case, uh, you would declare it as an environment variable. By default, it's going to look for next public Mapbox API key. Um, and then you can go ahead and deploy the site. Whenever you push to GitHub, it'll update with those changes. Um, and that's it. Uh, so uh, links for everything I've talked about today. Uh, if you want to take a look at the demo, it's available at webgeoda.org. Uh, all of the documentation, um, this is all work in progress. Um, so really appreciate any feedback or thoughts. Uh, the documentation is at docs.webgeoda.org. If you want to see more in the repo itself, and this is distributed as kind of a base repo, so everything is baked in, so you're able to go in and sort of mess around to your level of interest, uh, whether you just want to add some data, change the pages, or get into the React hooks and kind of the underlying data infrastructure. Uh, the repo is all, all open source uh, GPL license to go ahead and poke around in. Uh, it's uh, github.com slash geodacenter slash webgeoda. Uh, lastly, if you're interested in learning more about JS Geoda, and this is the WebAssembly uh, geospatial engine that's powering a lot of this, you can go to jsgeoda.libgeoda.org, um, and that's going to have a lot of the documentation to get started and, and look around a bit there, either client side or using uh, Node.js. Um, so with that, uh, I want to note, uh, give a nod to just a couple of other projects of note. 
uh, or that have been inspirations for this. So Kepler GL, uh, of course, uh, is a tremendous project that you know, has a lot in similar. Um, and Dataset as well, uh, Simon Williamson, uh, with kind of the ideas about this baked data uh, model. Uh, it has been somewhat influential in thinking about how this data gets presented or how this data gets served and then presented. Uh, and lastly, Vega and Vega Lite in particular have been important in thinking about what does the syntax look like? Uh, how does it work for a variety of different users, both uh, people trying to get into kind of a low code JavaScript world and, and senior veterans uh, alike? How do we appeal to that and kind of provide powerful tools to do that? So uh, with that, uh, that is all I have for today. I really appreciate uh, everyone sticking around and listening. Um, again, my name is Dylan Halpern. Feel free to reach out to me on Twitter at DC Halpern, or uh, you can find me on GitHub at No Further Information. Uh, if you want to shoot me an email, my email is down there, dhalpern at Um And uh, yeah, thank you everyone very much for, for listening, and uh, I'll look forward to any questions you have. Thank you very much, Dylan. That was an awesome talk. Um, we have one question, two questions, actually. So the first one, how is the situation on mobile devices? Does it work on phones? If not, what is the main bottleneck? Um, so I've been working on it just this week ahead of today's talk, actually. Um, so it works pretty well on phones. Um, and I'll say uh, the limitation up until this past week with the release of iOS 15 has been uh, iOS, uh, that the, the WebGL engine is substantially less powerful, but the, the new Metal API is, is re reasonably good. Um, so even with like 3,000 geographies before, that was the big bottleneck. Now I found it to be pretty good. So th there's going to be some adoption time for people upgrading, of course. Um, so knowing like for the short-term future, there may be limitations there, um, but it's pretty good. Beyond that, it's really just a kind of user interface design question and, and user experience. Um, right now, it's it's okay. Um, you know, there's sort of some challenges with getting the the widgets to like that relationship between map and widget. Uh, is like a little tricky to get right. So it's something we're still refining. I think you know, right now it's a little rough still, um, but in, in terms of the like main sort of defining features of having the variable, showing the data, loading everything in, it, it all works totally fine. Um, and uh, I would say very, very serviceable, especially in the landscape of mobile mapping uh, tools available. I see, thank you. So the next question is, uh, can I provide my own base styles as bugger? Absolutely. So right now uh, it's all through uh, Mapbox, but we are hoping to uh, expand it uh, as you know, uh, uh, Map Tiler uh, is is you know so robust, uh, as well as something like you know the Cardo CDN tiles. Um, all of those are currently supported in uh, the styles that we load in to DeckGL. Um, and so right now there's uh, just very simply a parameter. Um, so in your sort of config file underneath your, uh, your, your data and your, your GeoJSONs and your CSVs, et cetera, there's a, a styles uh, configuration. Um, and what you can do uh, specific to a Mapbox tile set is you can load in a, a Mapbox ID uh, and you can also specify which layer you want your polygons to be interleaved. So they're sort of embedded into your Mapbox style, right? And so by default, it tries to put it like underneath so you can see the labels, you can see the water, et cetera. Uh, so you can specify any Mapbox tile ID that you've made public. Um, and then you can also specify which layer it should put the polygons under. Um, so it's not totally, and, and I should say also uh, one thing here, this is all distributed kind of in a single repository when you make the, use it as a template. So if you want to go in and implement any tile solution or I mean, even go for uh, swap it out entirely for something like uh, Google Maps as a base map. Um, that's also right there to just go into the the kind of guts of what's going on and start messing around with that too. Um, but as it is right now, it's it's very easy to swap in uh, a different base map uh, depending on what you're interested in, um, color scheme, design, etc. So yeah, absolutely. Okay, and we have uh, time for one more question. Uh, can we do the work together with Open Layers, Leaflet, or Session Yet? Um, so e, that's this is a, this is a, an excellent question, uh, and the answer is for Cesium. Yes, definitely. Um, there's already integration uh, with DeckGL for doing sort of 3D tile layers. Um, 
As far as leaflet and uh, open layers go, uh, right now the sort of map component is specifically designed for uh, React Map GL and uh, uh, Deck GL. So it, it's not currently equipped for leaflet or open layer support. Um, however, I've been keeping my eye on on both as as really you know powerful and, and like widely used options. Um, so I, I'd love to in the future, <clears throat> especially for branching out to different JavaScript libraries uh, and uh, frameworks, uh, look at different options for kind of what that map view is, or even also like in terms of the layout, like this is very like a very map centric what I demoed today, but um, a lot of these other tools, you know, potentially have different different layout options. So um, I would say for now uh, it, it's not, but with code splitting uh, the way it is set up in Next.js and, and similar platforms like Nuxt with Vue, you know, there's no real cost to having separate components uh, to demo how to do different libraries here. Um, so it's it's something I'd su be super interested in working on. Uh, if, if it's something you'd be interested in contributing to, uh, hit me up. Um, but yeah, I, it's something I, I would love I would love to see. Uh, Open Layers has gotten super interesting. Um, and, and yeah, Leaflet's a classic, so yeah. It's an interesting invitation indeed. So this will be all. Thank you, Dylan, uh, for your talk. And see you around in InfoSwagy. All right, thank you everyone, appreciate it.